And dun, 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 dun. it looks like once again Tuesday. Hello, folks. Tuesday or Wednesday in Australia. That's already, right. Would you believe? Right. So, hello again, everybody. Good Glad morning, to see you. And I uh, hope you all continue to tune in because we have a very interesting guest today who knows the real story about the Beatles, the history, the, the background. Recordings. Yes, all the re Yes. And so uh, might I say, <laughs> I'm an extra. <laughs> Bless you. Extra chuff to have him because by profession, our guest is a CPA and today is tax day. Oh, yeah. So he's the busiest man on the planet. And the crowd goes wild, ladies and gentlemen, as we get ready to welcome Beatles historian and author and owner of Beetle.net, our friend from New Orleans, Mr. Bruce, Bruce Spizer. Spizer. Hello, Bruce. Good morning, Good morning afternoon you? and tomorrow in some places. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Thanks so much for doing this. I know it's tax day, so uh, to what do we owe the special honor? <laughs> uh, well, it's an honor for me to be here, and it's a nice diversion for a little while uh, to yeah, get my yeah. mind off of transferring That's money, right. paying taxes for various oh, trusts yeah. that I'm a trustee of. No. Yes, I know. Yeah. So uh, what I would love to know is how did you first get interested in the Beatles? Where did it all start for you? Uh, on the school bus in January of 1964, hearing I want to hold your hand on the radio and uh, just thinking that's something different and uh, hearing yeah. it again and, and then really just really loving the group. Prior to the Beatles, my favorite group was the Coasters, who very much influenced the Beatles in many ways. And yeah. what I loved about the Coasters was that the bulk of the songs were written by two people, Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller. And when I got a copy of Meet the Beatles, I noticed most of the songs were written by two chaps, John Lennon and Paul McCartney, and they yeah. were in the group. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. Yeah. Right. Yes, yes it was because... unusual, wasn't it, in those days? Yes, for very much so. Groups not to just do cover tunes. Well, I mean, it was it mm -hmm. was the era of professional writers in the Brill Building, right? And, and yeah. They, that was, yeah. they wrote and artists interpreted and never mm -hmm. the twain shall mix. And uh, mm. I mean, even Elvis sang, you know, other people's songs, right? Yeah, I mean, I think Buddy Holly might have been the closest to a self-contained unit, although he didn't write all his material either, but he did write a lot of it. And yeah. Chuck Berry, That's of right. course, but right. many artists did not write their own material. And in England, you know, one of the um, the influences that they would point to would be Lonnie Donegan. The, the Skiffle King. Skiffle, yeah. yeah. Who, yeah. You know, he was one of the very first early people who started messing around and saying, well, why can't I create the music? That's you right. Know, so. And making a bass out of a tea chest. Yeah. That was revolutionary. And it started, I mean, they're still going today, aren't they, in a lot of country bands? Skiffle groups no, and yeah. tea chest bass, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, the thing that amazes me about the Beatles, of course, you talk about Skiffle, you talk about, for me, the Everly Brothers harmonies. Uh, where they got their harmonies from, Chuck Berry, rock and roll, and so many elements. And I always tell people it's just like the Beatles were the world's biggest sponge. They sponged up yes. these wonderful influences, gave it their own spin, and then they released it back into the world. That's right, yes. And not and just that, music, everything. <laughs> yeah, that's right, lifestyle. Yeah, Indeed. we were talking about this the other day about how they were really kind of one of the first influences, if you will. That's right. Yes. Um, you know, Ringo played a Pearl drum kit. Everybody wanted Ringo's drum kit. Everybody wanted a Hofner bass. That's right. Um, yes. And then, of course, along came the whole Maharishi era. And the hairdos and the cost, the clothes. The clothes. The fashion and then, cars. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, I was telling Bruce that when George first came back from India, he was shocked to find that there was no real Indian restaurants in London. No, that's right. And he and a couple of friends invested. So, you know, would Indian food have become so popular so quickly without George Harrison? We'll never know. Yeah. But yeah. um, because it was all eyes on the Fab Four, everything they did, wore and yeah. ate and drank, uh, was the thing, mm -hmm. right? Yes, indeed. And nobody was more surprised than they were, that's for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They thought it was <laughs> mad. Yeah. They thought it was yeah. absolutely mad. So back to your um, myriad book um, output mm -hmm. that you've done, what gave you the... Um, what was the fascination? I mean, are you a musician or are you, you're just an audiophile or both? Why did you really concentrate on the albums and the recording? What, what aspect of, of that was it that fascinated you the most? Well, it was kind of both. I used to play in a band in high school. And of course, uh, you know, we played a lot of Beatles stuff. I played primarily guitar, although I could dabble at bass a little bit and keyboards very little bit. Um, but anyway, it was... Um, 
you know, I'd always loved the music in high school and junior high and elementary school going back with the Beatles. So mm -hmm. when I went to college, I still followed the solo careers as much. Um, but, you know, there came a time when I kind of got away from it and was busy practicing law. And what really started the whole thing, and if you live in New Orleans, you can appreciate this. One day I noticed that my album record collection had been attacked by roaches and they had eaten the spines primarily of Beatle albums. They left Meet the Beatles alone, thank you. <laughs> meet the Beatles, literally. <laughs> the, the roaches yeah. meet the Beatles. <laughs> well, I wanted to replace some of these records and in doing so, I didn't want to go out and buy like the 1990s pressings. I wanted to get the 1960s pressings, which yes. meant I need to do a little bit of research. Mm. And I was fascinated by the early albums on VJ, uh, you know, introducing the Beatles. And, um, yeah. you know, and I thought this is kind of in this Jolly Watt album that combined Frank Ifield and the Beatles. And I start reading about it. And what I was reading in many ways did not make any sense to me. And I would ask a record or memorabilia dealer about it. And that's, oh, yeah, it's in all the books. Well, me being an attorney thought, what if every book's wrong? And so what I did was I did some original research and I knew that the Beatles were in VJ and Capitol at around the same time. So obviously they had to have sued each other. And I found four major lawsuits. Uh, there were, I think, two in New York, one in Chicago and one in L.A. And I got copies of those lawsuits sent to me. And from that, I had the research to do the book, The Beatles Records on VJ. Wow. And it was going to be a one off book. I'll put out this one book and it'll be a little footnote in Beatles history. And when the book came out, people liked it. And they said, when's the Capitol book coming out? And so <laughs> what else we okay, well, we'll do a book on Capitol. Uh -huh. And as I was starting that book and people knew I was working on it, they were saying, well, of course, after the Capitol book, you'll have to do a book on Apple records. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing you know, all of a sudden people have plotted out an entire series of books for me to do oh. about the Beatles music. And I took a detour uh, for, it was back in 2004, for the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' arrival in America with a book called The Beatles Are Coming, which is actually my favorite book because the convoluted story of how Beatlemania evolved in America, if I had written a work of fiction like that and submitted it to a publisher, they would have looked at it and laughed and said, nobody will believe that could ever have yeah. happened. Get out of here. Yeah, I know. And it did. You know, when you, when you tell people that, you know, well, what, why did Beatlemania explode in America? Well, we knew the music was great, but right. what caused this big explosion? Well, yes. the little known thing that actually pushed it was that uh, the CBS Evening News expanded from a 15-minute broadcast to a 30-minute broadcast in September of 63. And you might say, well, what, why is that a big deal? Because rather than 15 minutes of pure news, it gave them the opportunity to run feature stories. Uh, and so um, the U.S. networks heard about this thing, Beatlemania, and they sent film crews to Bournemouth on November 16th. And NBC, ABC, and CBS took footage of it. NBC rushed out a story that Monday, uh, and CBS was going to run the story later in the week. And uh, it ran on the CBS Morning News with Mike Wallace, but it yeah. didn't run that evening. And why? Prime because it was November 22nd and President Kennedy was assassinated within uh -huh. hours of Mike Wallace running a story on the Beatles. Wow. And so, of course, there was no feature stories that night. No. But you get to December 10th and Walter Cronkite says, well, you know, we could use something kind of fun. This Beatles yeah. story is kind of interesting. It's light. We'll get our mind off the Kennedy assassination, the Cold War, you know, yeah. Civil rights, all these horrible things going on that we need yeah. a, a fun way to end the broadcast. So he broadcasts it that night in two very important people see it. Actually, one person who would become important, the first important person to see it's Ed Sullivan. A month earlier, he had booked the Beatles for his show, but hadn't done any publicity on it. All no. of a sudden now, they're on the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. So CBS uh, immediately yes. began plugging we're going to have the Beatles. Yep. The other thing was this 15-year-old girl, Marsha Albert from Silver Spring, Maryland, saw the broadcast. And during it, the Beatles perform She Loves You. And so she writes a letter to WWDC, you know, kind of like Chuck Berry said, I'm going to write a little letter to my local DJ. DJ, my local DJ. I saw this group, the Beatles, 
on the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite, why can't we have music like that in America? Well, pure luck, one of the disc jockeys there, Carol James, knows someone who was a stewardess, as they were called back then, yeah. from BOAC. And he oh, asked yeah. her, can you bring me the Beatles' latest record, which is I Want to Hold Your Hand. Gosh. By that time, Capitol had signed the Beatles, but wasn't going to release the record until mid-January. Instead, right. what happens is on December 17th, Carol James is invited down to the station and in a very cute little voice, you know, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in America, here are the Beatles with I Want to Hold Your Hand. And they saved the tape remarkably. And when the song's over, Carol James says, well, let us know what you think of the song. Well, the switchboard lights up like a Christmas tree yeah. and everyone wants to hear it again. And so Carol James and WWDC keep playing the record. And of course, Capital is upset by this because the record's not supposed to come out till mid-January. So they can buy it yet, oh, right? Threaten to sue them. And WDC says, are you nuts? It's a hit. And so Capital realizes our job is to get radio stations to play records, not to not play them. So they That's change right. the plans <laughs> oh. and they rush the record out the day after Christmas. Normally, when you get to you know Thanksgiving in the U.S., no new product till January. No, yet they rush not. the record out. And in New York, the day after Christmas, WMCA jumps on the record, WABC and WINS follow. And all of a sudden in New York, in a very short period of time, I want to hold your hand as number one in the rest of the nation shortly follows. So yeah. what caused Beatlemania in America to explode? Walter Cronkite, a 15-year-old girl in a disc jockey. And none of that would have happened had not the CBS Evening News expanded from 15 minutes to 30 minutes. I mean, yeah. just a bunch of crazy things. Now, that yeah. said, why did it happen? Because the music was great. Yes. But the reason it exploded the way it did, think about it. Kids are out of school and they're hearing, I want to hold your hand. They have Christmas and Hanukkah money. Mommy and daddy can take them to the record store. They can buy the records. So by the time the Beatles are on Ed Sullivan on February 9th, Normally, the show drew 20 to 30 million. So let's say the record came out in mid-January, and it's maybe top 10 by then. Right. So maybe 30 million people watch them. But because by the time that the Beatles were on that show, it was saturation airplay for not only I Want to Hold Your Hand, yep. but She Loves You, Please Please Me, and even album cuts from Meet the Beatles, right. uh, such as Ringo, you know, yeah. singing I Want to Be Your Man was getting airplay. And the VJ album, Twist and Shout. So all this happens because of those strange little things. Talent yeah. will out, of course, but it may not have exploded the way it did, but for these strange set of facts. What was the, uh, what was the overall viewership that February, February 9th? 73 million. Oh, that's more than oh, double well, what they usually got. Those days. More, much more than double. And in those days, a significant portion of the United States population. Yeah. Uh, not only yeah. that, but... Uh, if you adjust it for population, maybe one or two Super Bowls may have topped it, but that's about it. So yeah. still adjust it for population, one of the largest television audiences ever uh, to watch a show in America. Wow, that's incredible. So this is, this is February 1964. Um, fast forward six months to the August of that year, which is when Angie met Jim mm -hmm. McCartney, who later mm -hmm. became my, my dad. Um, and obviously, we were well aware in England of, you know, the Beatles then because they, they'd already conquered Germany and England and Europe and Sweden yeah. and everywhere. And so when you think about when Paul would come home to our house in Heswell, to Rembrandt, which he still owns to this day, it's a beautiful house, but it's smaller than the house I live in now. Um, That's it's probably name. about 2,600 square feet. Mm -hmm. um, and he's been around the world and on the road. And, and my dad would say things to him like, son, Dick, get your feet off the coffee table. And, <laughs> and, and, oh, dad. oh, I tell you what, Jim's famous one. He used to say, how are your bowels, son? Oh, dad. <laughs> you're typical you're parent. You're know. easy. You, you're probably, you I always... know you're out there in America. You're probably eating all that room service cheeseburger nonsense. Are you regular? Are you going <laughs> around? <Are> you, <laughs> your, your hair's a bit scruffy. You need to, you need to get, get your brother Michael. Oh, to man. You know, well, so you there know. he is. He's been around and conquered the world, and all of a sudden he's home with his dad and us. Talking you, about toilet facilities. And put, yeah, put, yeah. Your, put yeah. your cup and saucer in the sink like yeah. everybody else. Yeah, you know. right, yeah. Do you remember that time John Lennon 
wanted another cup of tea. Yes, I walked into the lounge and they, they were all chatting, Jim and Paul and John Lennon. And they, I'd given them tea and John just did this with a cup of saucer, didn't look up at me, just waggled it. And I said, excuse me, I got all, you know, all Maggie Smith on him. I said, we have a little word in this house, please. Oh, I'm sorry, Ange. Please, may I have another cup of tea? You know. Well, yeah. And even then, Jim and Paul were going, you don't do that well, to you, you gotta, you got to bring them back down to earth. Exactly. Because everybody exactly. was taking care of them hand and foot and wanted to do yeah, things for right. them to yeah. get in their good yeah. graces. Yeah. And they have yeah, to be regular they, people, too. Yeah, that's right. He, he evidently told Cynthia later on, he's like, oh, she's only four foot ten, but don't mess with that end. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, but, you know, I was five, five, six, seven years old in those days, and she was trying to bring me up with proper manners and please and thank you. And that's right. Put your knife yeah. and fork Nobody together. waggles their teacup at me. Yeah. So. <laughs> don't blame you. Don't it blame you one bit. But, you know, and the interesting thing, um, the book I'm currently working on, and it's going to actually launch on uh, Friday, I guess it's April 21, is going to cover the Please Please Me and with the Beatles albums. And right. um, the book is pretty much finished, although I'm tweaking it. But what was so interesting was to see, of course, the people in England were very curious to see how the Beatles would do, because no British act had ever had sustained success in America. Uh, right. Uh, Laurie London, you know, a 12-year-old boy, he had a big hit with He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. Yeah. Uh, that was a real, you know, anomaly. And yes, the thing about it was, um, you know, that you had people that were just saying, I don't think they'll be able to, to, to make it in America. And of course, when they did, the British Music Weekly's Enemy, Melanie Maker, Record Mara, and you know, all of them were reporting, uh, you know, with excitement of all that the Beatles were doing, you know, all the records were running up the charts and, you know, and the whole thing. So there was a lot of British pride for their success in America. And I think the very fact, like, you're born with a sense of humor in Liverpool. It's absolutely, you know, there's no escape. You have to have a sense of humor if you're a scouser. And they all had that way of ragging on each other. Right. And people just couldn't deal with it. They couldn't make it up. But it's a form of affection. Like, she and I, we still slag each other off dreadfully. <laughs> but a, a sort of, sort of lover, you she, know. She's a lying old bag. It's not true. <laughs> <laughs> people quite, even now, to this day, people did you hear how she spoke to her mother? <laughs> um, our friend Dave Hauser is asking, Bruce, have you ever met any of the Beatles? Did you ever get I to have, well, them? I've I've met Ringo and I've met Pete Best, which has to count because he was yes. a Beatle for a while. Oh, yes. And I was at an event uh, that Paul was at for the Love Show when it debuted. Oh. And Paul was sitting down on a chair. And quite frankly, although I don't think he intended to do so, he really was holding court. And all these yeah. famous people like Ravi Shankar and, yeah. you know, George Martin, people were coming up to him. And it didn't feel right for me to just push through the crowd and oh, say, what a shame. hello, Sir Paul, I'm Bruce Spicer from New Orleans. I figure, I'm sure, I would love to meet Paul one day, but I'd like to do it on relaxing terms rather than yeah. just a oh, quick hello. Yeah, that's right. He would have been fine, though. He is so good at being famous and he's so gracious. And he, he's mm -hmm. got that thing where he can literally, he's, I don't know what the trick is, but in a green room before a show, he will notate something about, you'll get introduced, he'll clock your name and he'll notate something that you're wearing or your glasses or something about you that remind, he'll make a bridge in his mind mm. that reminds. To bring that into the conversation. Yeah, he'll go out and do a three hour show. And then if he meets you again afterwards, he still knows your name. That's an amazing talent. Uh, and, you know, the thing too is, you know, while I didn't, uh, you know, meet, you know, really have conversations per se with the Beatles, I was very fortunate enough to, I uh, have a few brief interviews with Sir George Martin, but also oh, press man. people like, you know, Tony Barrow and Tony Bramwell. Oh. And what was yeah. great with, you know, Tony Barrow and the likes and Bramwell yes. as well was the stories that they knew and yeah. they really understood a lot of the reasons of why things happened the way they did. And yeah, that right. gave me a great insight. The way I really, you know, I think it would be pointless in many ways for me to, so if I were to talk to Paul to say, well, Paul, can you tell me, about that particular recording when I can take a copy of say, you know, New Musical Express and read an right. interview with Paul where Paul says, oh yeah, on that song, you know, I played piano and George Martin added a piano part because the contemporary things are so much better than the memory. 
So yes. uh, That's right. people in England were really fortunate in that they had, you know, four primary musical weeklies plus a few others like Pop Weekly, yes. Book, and other things. In the U.S., Rolling Stone wasn't around then, and we didn't have nothing. We would learn about a new Beatle record when we heard a song on the radio or saw a record in a record store. And yeah. that's what I love about researching these books is getting all this yes. wonderful information and right. thinking how exciting it must have been growing up in England where you could read like Revolver. You could read yeah. about it for a few months before it came out. You couldn't yeah. hear it, but you knew they had a weird song with electronics and another one with strings and another one with Indian instruments. Mm. That must have been a, it's a totally different experience in the U.S., that's yeah, and, um, yes. our friend Efrat is on from, from Israel, and she's saying 1964 they were banned from playing in Israel because the government thought they'd make the youngsters go <laughs> wild, which is ridiculous because as if without the Beatles they were behaving like a group of angels, which apparently they were not in 19. <laughs> but isn't it funny? You know, all around the world everybody was aware, even even Israel and what have you, they were aware of the Beatles. Some, some places they got to play and some places they didn't, but... That I think, yeah, like um, you said at the beginning, the music is just great. Mm. You know, it just it's 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 universal. It lifted everybody yeah, up. I guess they were, they, you know, it. yeah. Well, when New Orleans, they were going to stay at the Roosevelt Hotel, which was a very classy downtown hotel. And when the Roosevelt realized this was going to be the Beatles, they said, "We don't want yeah. them." So no. instead, they played. They stayed at a place called the Congress Hen out on Sheffman Tour Highway which was very, you know, just a motor motel, as we would call them in those yeah. days, yeah. and not very classy at all. Uh, right. So there was always that fear about things. And when the Beatles played New Orleans, uh, the girls in particular, it was a football stadium, and they ran from the stands onto the field, and the New Orleans Police Department is chasing them and horseback and gathering them up and getting them back in. And the other funny thing that, uh, in this film of it all, it's quite fun to watch, the other funny yeah. thing was some of the more industrious girls um, went ahead and rented a wheelchair and pretended they were crippled and had oh. one of their friends push them in a wheelchair. And the amazing thing about the Beatles was when they came on stage, they cured these girls and they were able to stand up. Isn't that amazing? Oh, yeah. 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 I've never I've been that saved. One. Yeah. I've never oh, that boy. Yeah. When people used every to city, approach. every city had its own story, yeah. you know, and, and it was because, you know, when the Beatles showed up at a place in the States, there would be a press conference in every city. Think about yes. that. Just crazy. Yeah. <laughs> right. We had the we had the good fortune to visit uh, Oak Park, Illinois, outside uh, Chicago. We just played the Arcada Theater with Liverpool Legends, uh, Ron Onesti's mm. beautiful place out there. And we went to interview Val Camaletti from Valhalla Records before she passed. Yeah, yeah. And I've interviewed her before. Wonderful lady. Val, Val she was, was great. Was great yes, wonderful. Mm. And um, she used to call them my boys, you know. And they would come into town in the plane. She, she told us a story about every time they came to Chicago, where they were, which airfield they were going to land the plane at changed three times on the way in because <laughs> girls would find out and scream, break down the fence and they'd go, oh, we'll divert the plane to so-and-so, you know. Mm. And they played um, Comiskey Field in Chicago on that particular trip. Mm -hmm. And she was assigned to them. She was doing uh, inside promotion for a capital in Chicago. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, mm -hmm. she was assigned to them. And John said to her, well, you know, do you, do you want to come with us in the, in the limo tonight? Jump in and, you know, stand on the side of the stage and you, you can be my sort of, you know, Chicago chaperone or whatever. And she said, nope, I don't, no, nope, I don't want to go. And he said, what, I've just offered you free backstage ticket to a Beatles concert in your hometown. She said, nope. She said, I'm not going to have my, the, the girls in my hometown screaming and making a noise above my boy's music. It's just a bloody and wetting insult. Their pants, and wetting she said, their pants. Yeah. She said, I, I, if I want to hear you play, I want to hear you play. I don't want to hear screaming. It's just bloody insulting. So I'm going to, you ring me up afterwards and we'll go and get a coffee, but I'm, I'm not going to watch that. <laughs> No the only person to ever turn down such an event. You imagine passing up a side stage yeah. past Comiskey Field. That's <laughs> no, amazing. But, you know, it's 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 so interesting, you know, when you go to sit down and write about it and, and do the research and go through all the old music magazines, all the fun little things you learn and, and stuff. And it's been fascinating where I thought I was finished with writing because I wrote about all the different records in America on all the different labels. And then yeah. uh, a guy named Frank Daniels put the bug in my ear. We need to do a British book on the records because nobody's really done one. So we did right. that. And I thought, okay, yeah. I'm done. 
And then when the uh, you know 50th anniversary of Sergeant Pepper came along, I'd written an article and I thought, well, it's an interesting article. Where can I get it published? And the problem was that I knew if I had it published, I would lose complete control over the images and things I wanted with it. And, and I thought, well, maybe I'll put up my own magazine. And then I thought, I don't know a thing about putting out magazines, but I know yeah. a lot about putting out books because I write and publish my own books. Right. And so I did this Sergeant Pepper book and I had a deadline. I wanted to get out in time, which meant I literally needed a little help from my friends. And so I turned to people like Al Sussman and Bill King of Beetle Fan Magazine and right. um, Frank Daniels uh, and, um, you know, and then also Pierce Hemmingson from Canada and we yep. put together a book and the formula was to write about what was happening when the Beatles, you know, put it in contemporary terms. What was it like to be growing up in the U.S. when Sgt. Pepper came out? You know, what reviews were there? What were the stories around it? Did the same oh, thing for, yes. the, for England. Pierce wrote about uh, Canada. And then we wrote some articles about well, what was going on in the world, what was going on in music and then yep. how the music was recorded. But the interesting section, and I've used this in all of my album series books, is I just ask people for fan recollections. Tell me your story. Yep. And what yes. amazed me about Pepper was a number of people <laughs> who had stories relating with a parent where they mm -hmm. would say, well, you know, I, you know, I bonded with my father over when I'm 64. Yep. You know, my dad hated the music I listened to, but he loved that song. Yep. Or, you know, or, you know, my yes. mother wanted to see what the excitement was about. So we listened to it together and, yep. you know, yep. and shared our thoughts. Yes. And then the other thing which shouldn't have surprised me, of course, was musicians are Beatle fans. What a shock. Oh, yeah. And the weird and the first one I got from a musician was a guy who was in this group, the Royal Guardsmen, who did the Snoopy songs. Uh -huh. Like, you know, Snoopy versus a Red Baron and Snoopy's Christmas. Oh, yeah. And his story was he was driving to the studio to record Snoopy's Christmas, which would have been recorded, of course, in the summer. And the radio station starts playing Sgt. Pepper. So he pulls over to the side of the road to listen to it. And then after that, he goes into the studio to record Snoopy's Christmas. That must have been <laughs> a real experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, you know, it was just um, another really touching story was uh, I had a friend who knew Peter Tork and I asked her if she could contact Peter. And so about two months go by and I, you know, and I shoot her an email and I said, have you talked to Peter yet? And she emails back, Bruce, I'm so sorry. I forgot to do so. Let me email him now. And so 20 minutes later, I see an email coming in and I figure it's either going to be Peter's agreed to do so or Peter's not interested. Instead, the email said, here's what Peter wrote. And of course, it had to have been from the heart because he wrote it in 20 minutes. Yeah, I okay. And, you know, that and then I knew someone who knew Billy Joel's manager. So Billy Joel, you know, I interview him and he writes a little piece about it. So not only did we have everyday people, but also mm -hmm. very famous people with great little stories. Yeah, and so yeah. that's a tradition of all these album series books mm -hmm. is just having people, you know, write their own recollections about it. And for some people, they tell me it's their favorite part of the book because, yeah. you know, they recognize themselves in it yes. or yep. something totally different. And they're like, wow, how neat that must have been to have experienced it that way. So it, it's well, Angie's, a great project. Angie's next book, which is um, called There Are Faces I Remember, um, is is similar along those lines. It's, it's all of the people that she's met mm. personally oh, face yeah. to face in the Beatles orbit. And in doing the celebrity fans chapter, the person who came back to, we, we have, you know, like Stephen uh, Colbert has the Colbert questionnaire and he asks, you know, favorite sandwich, blah, blah, blah. So we mm -hmm. have the Angie questionnaire and it's uh -huh. just a quick, a quick five questions. Uh, and the person who wins the medal for coming back the fastest with the answer to the five questions is Gene Simmons from Kiss. Yeah. <laughs> he was actually about to Board go a, on a ship yeah. to do a cruise. And somebody that we know in, in Canada that I know is friendly with him, I just shot this gentleman an email and said, you know, sometime when you're in touch with Gene, Gene Simmons, would you ask him, is he interested in the Beatles? Was he and what was? And he said, oh, he's going on a cruise, a kiss cruise this afternoon. Let me call <laughs> you back. And within an hour, I had my five questions answered. Yep. Yeah, we have, we have met him on several occasions. That's the caveat to this this book that oh, I yes, writing it's all now. people that have met. She yeah. has to have physically interacted or have a story, yeah. a personal story with yes. him. So it's been yeah. quite a fun project. Mm. 
putting together. And, and you realize over the years how many people in the Beatle family that you've met. I mean, you have you have a chapter in there. Oh yeah, you're, you're in it. Oh yeah, because of our interactions at Beetle Fest and so on. Yeah. So it's just the the circle widens every year, and there, there seem to be more and more. Everybody says, "Oh, all that old music." You know, the Beatles fandom is waning; it'll die eventually. Yeah. I don't. Were you at the no. most recent uh, fest? Yes, Mark the Beatles' is fest. Yes. yes, in New York. That's right. In fact, tell yeah. tell us about you did an interesting a, a switch a twist on a panel with Piers and Mark Lewison, didn't you, Bruce? Yeah, that was I thought oh. it was really a fun panel because what we did was um, we would call it the panel growing up with the Beatles, and all three of us had grown up with the Beatles with different circumstances. Mark in England. Pierce starting in England, but quickly moving to Canada, and then myself in the United States. And so we experienced it differently in England, as we mentioned earlier, you had all those great music magazines. We didn't have it in the States. But on the other hand, we had it explode at one time. So we got, you know, for, for me, I want to hold your hand. Uh, she loves you and please, please me were contemporary. Whereas in the UK, of course, they were spread out over time. You know, differences yeah. like that. Yeah, That's Pierce, right. in Canada, they were getting a little bit of airplay, but not a lot, you know, and just all sorts of differences. Mark Lewison couldn't comprehend the fact that in the United States, every city had several radio stations that could play as much music as they wanted whenever they wanted. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas when he started, there were needle restrictions where the yeah, BBC right. could only play a limited amount of music each day on right. record because of the That's musicians right. union. So, yeah. I mean, it was right. just totally different experiences and it was, yeah. you know, a really fun panel to be on. Well, the, the needle restrictions came from the fact that musicians, unions and writers and publishers had to get their royalties from the BBC. And the BBC's income was limited to the amount of people, households who had a radio and television blanket license. license. So you, to have okay. a radio or a TV in England, still to this day, you have to pay oh, a license. yearly license fee. That's what pays mm -hmm. for the BBC. And part of that goes to production and, and real estate and um, personnel. And then the other part of it goes back out in royalties. So that's why they had so many talk shows and news shows and whatever, because they mm -hmm. simply didn't have the money to play the music. Yep. <laughs> and, you know, talking about all, all of this magazines and publicity, my first recollection is of Tony Barrow and uh, Bill Harry. Yes. You know how they started their little one sheet. And, uh, you know, Brian became interested and, I think Bill Harry borrowed some money from somebody so he could print 500 copies or something. What became Mersey yeah. Beat. Yeah, that's right. Fantastic yeah. magazine. And then oh, Tony absolutely. moved down to London, of course. Yeah. But Bill kept going and they eventually moved to London too. Bill Harry has actually written um, oh, quite a few articles, uh, blog articles for our Martin's daily newspaper, McCartney.com, which is everything rock and roll and Beatles all the McCartney time, Times. But McCartney Times mm. at McCartney.com. So perhaps if you've got any articles that you would uh, share with us, Bruce, for, you know, that will help, we can link to your books and your, oh, and yeah, book and people yeah. can learn more. I'll put you in touch with Martin and maybe you've got some, you know, little anecdotes from your books that we could publish and, mm. and uh, let the, let the rest of the world know what fantastic work you've done. It's not just the passion that, you know, I love about you. It's, it's the meticulous research. That's yes. your lawyer and, and accounting and CPA mind, right? So you know no. when you pick up a Bruce Spicer book, it's the shit. You know, it's just, it is what yeah. it is. And yes. it's, it's, there's no like, hmm, <clears throat> that's, that's really what I admire most about your work is oh, you. even yeah. though it's meticulously researched, it doesn't come off like a heavy read or a no. textbook or no, no, no. a learning. I keep it's, seeing it's messages experience. from Debbie Martin, by the way. Debbie was at the, the most re recent Fest, I think. Yep. She, Debbie's yeah. just saying, love your pals. <laughs> yes. And she'll oh, thank you, Debbie. See you in February. Yeah. yeah. No, there's, there's a, a she lot. writes to me every single morning when I go on my Facebook page. There's always a little little greeting from Debbie every morning. Yeah, it's beautiful. She yeah, starts it's the so day. Nice. Thank you, Debbie. You start yeah. her day with a smile. Yeah. And then I come downstairs and ruin it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, know, you, yeah. you know, you you do meet so many wonderful people in the uh, Beatles world. And, yeah. uh, you know, people, when they talk about the fest, and there was a, a friend of mine who I met through the fest named Karen, and, the, and, and she started going way, way, way before I did. I mean, I feel like a rookie. My first fest was like in 1996, so that makes me like a rookie by comparison. <laughs> yeah. And so, 
you know, the interesting thing about it and, and what she said was that initially, you know, people would go to the fest to buy the stuff because you couldn't get that. There was no eBay, you know, and, and that right. was a place yeah, to get right. stuff. Yeah. And then yeah. she would go to see the guests. Yeah. And then sadly, a lot of the really good guests have been dying off. Yeah. And she said, now I go to be with my friends. Yep. And, yes. You know, and and like the family reunion. Yeah. yeah. What, yeah. What the Lapidus family, all of them, Tilly and them and, and Jessica, Jessica Tilly and Michelle and, and Mark and Carol have kept alive is really, they've, they've built this kind of crazy tie dye family yeah. from oh. all around the world. And then when COVID happened, they pivoted so quickly. Yes. And Tilly uh, was a genius. I was talking to them about, you know, how the hell are you going to do Beetle Fest? And they're like, well, Zoom, let's figure it out. And that's um, all you can do. <laughs> yeah. Tilly and I spent quite a bit of time on the phone back and forth on, you know, just ideas of how we could sort of, you know, the breakout rooms and the Zoom rooms. And, and they Ooh. figured it all out and did yeah. an incredible job. Um, yeah, COVID, and I, think, uh, I think that what that did was that that increased the um, oh yes the audience sure it physically mm -hmm. of Beetle Fest simply yes. because people like Efrat in Israel or you know people in Scotland wherever Australia could attend and feel like part of that extended family. That's right. Yeah. So, Ooh, out of Eagle, it was good, you know. Oh yeah. What I remember with COVID was, uh, you know, I was working on a book that was going to come out, uh, you know, nice on the anniversary type thing of. Let It Be, the book was going to be called The Beatles Finally Let It Be, which was a bit of a joke because the Let It Be album, you know, when's it going to come out? That was all Rolling Stone was reporting on, it seemed. And so it finally comes out. So I have this idea for the book. And the day after I signed the contract with my printer to have the book printed and all, um, I find out that uh, all of a sudden, you know, the Let It Be get back project has been pushed back. And so all of a sudden, you know, I don't have this tie in that I right. thought I was going to have. I'm coming out with a book and there's not going to be, you know, oh. a universal music group, Apple release. There's not going to be the Peter Jackson film. All of this has been delayed. And yeah. so the decision I had to make was, do I, do I wait a year or do I put the book out? I mean, I could have told the printer, let's wait a year, but I talked about it with a few people and the consensus was, let's just put it out. You know, yeah. because people are going to be interested in it regardless. And yeah. it worked out well. And I think people appreciated it. And then, Good. you know, in the middle of everybody with the Peter Jackson film and all, yes. I had a new book out and that covered Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine. So yes. it worked yeah. out OK, you know, but oh, it was yeah. an adjustment trying to figure out what do I do? <laughs> Yeah, no, it was, it was difficult. Yeah. Karen, uh, Karen is on, Karen Reader. He's, he said he joined a bit late, and uh, he's asking, do you all give the coasters still? A are you still listening to the coasters? They had great songwriters. We talked about that a little bit at the top, so that's a good yeah. question from Karen. Do you do you listen to anything but the Beatles, and if so, what, oh. the, what is that? Yeah, absolutely. I love a lot of the old rhythm and blues music. Uh, you know, I listen to a lot of Fats Domino, Little Richard, the coasters. I have a, several coaster CDs that have – you know, a lot more depth than the greatest hits thing. The reason I got into the coasters was I had a cousin who went to Tulane University in New Orleans, and he was a bit of a cut up. And he gave my sisters the album, The Coasters Greatest Hits. Uh -huh. And, you know, and some of the songs on it, like Yakety Yak and Charlie Brown, that was kind of like his personality. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and when I heard the record, I loved it. And I just permanently borrowed it from my sisters and still have oh, it to this day. Permanently borrowed it. I like yeah. that. <laughs> Yeah. There's another there's another verb for that, but I won't bring that up here. No, we wouldn't say that. You know, and, and, you know, and, and oddly enough, I, I had sisters that were seven and eight years older than me, and and they did have some good records. I mean, they had you know, please, Mister Postman by the Marvelettes. Yeah, and you know, and I was very familiar with the song when I heard it by the Beatles. And what I noticed for the most part, even as a kid, was for the most part, the Beatles would take one of those songs and slightly push the beat just a little bit. You know, and then, of course, you know, I had heard Long Tall Sally by Little Richard growing up as a kid. And when I heard it by the Beatles, the difference was that Paul out little Little Richard. You know, let's yeah. be blunt. Yeah. You know, yeah. Be that in Twist and Shout by John are two of the greatest rock vocals. They sang of all the crap out of it. Yeah. yeah. And the other know. thing is when people tell me Ringo's not that good a drummer, I make them huh. listen to Long Tall Sally and yeah. say, you try doing what he did at the end of that song. Good luck. 
Well, and not Plus only he's that, left-handed, bless him. Yeah, he's left-handed, and so is Paul. So they have a certain, mm. you know, brain chemistry. Plus, if you think about, you know, the way Ringo can change from four-four to to three-four to a waltz, and then back into four-four, fussing and fighting, my friend. Oh, yeah, we can work it up. I have always thought, you know, yeah. I mean, changing timings, and he swings. I think we talked about this the other day, no, we Bruce. Did, yeah. Yeah. He he's left-handed, but oftentimes they would show up at a club in Liverpool, and the drum kit is set up for a right-hander. So he had to switch his brain around and learn to swing with it the other way. So, yeah, well, and you know, the other the other thing too is you know there are a lot of there are a few great um, Beatle tribute bands out there, but only a few. Yeah. I've seen hundreds of them, and it's oh, always the Ringo, the Ringo, and a right-handed Paul. Will do, you know? Well, I think the thing that I've always I'll said do. is very few of the drummers understand Ringo. In that they, it's not all about the beat. He has an element of jazz swing, very yep. subtle, but it's there. And the other thing with Paul is that most of the Beatle bands have a guy who's either what I call ballad Paul or rock and roll Paul. Very yep. few have a yep. Paul that can do both well. Right. You know, mm -hmm. guy might nail Long Tall Sally, but he's going to struggle with Yesterday. Or maybe yep. he's great on Yesterday, but when he's got to do I'm Down, it just doesn't work. And you think about it, Paul yep. in the same day, did yesterday I'm down and I've just seen a face. Now, how yes. can you sing those three songs in one day? I know. Because well, he can. Because yeah. he can. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Good on him. Well, thank you so much, Bruce, for taking the time. This I know, lovely. especially, I wasn't yeah. even thinking it was tax day when I asked you uh, a <laughs> month or two ago to come on here. So, so sorry about that. But no. um, all you lovely kids, if you don't know Bruce already, and I'm sure everybody does, but just a reminder to go to beetle.net he's got his his own books there and his imagine a wonder publishing yeah. book collection the box set as we like to call it yes and um mm. new books new books coming soon so make sure you go sign up at beetle.net for the newsletter and thanks right. so much for tuning in and uh, what have you got on tap for the rest of the day back to, back to the real world back to the law world unfortunately and, uh, you know, and then I'll go home and relax a bit and then start tomorrow with a few things I have to put off because of tax time. Um, and us. You know, and then it's going to get crazy this Friday because we're going to start taking orders on the new book on the website, Beetle.net. And what we tell people is if you order it from us, you'll get your book one to two months in advance of everybody else. Because I can't compete financially with Amazon, but no, I can tell them you order from my website. And I sign all the books, and I'll even personalize them if you like. That is fabulous. Thank you so much once again. Go find Bruce at Beetle.net and go find this one at Mrs. McCartney's Tease.com. And Martin this at one. Martin and Martin. See what I mean? Martin at McCartney.com and me at McCartney.ai. We'll talk about that one. Bye-bye. I've enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Bye, Bruce. God bless. Thank bye -bye. you.